And thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, you have done some pretty interesting and notable things in the field of computer vision. Why, why did you choose computer vision of all fields to explore? And what's so special about the modality of vision? I think for me, vision is, is an interesting modality, primarily because it's such a rich modality. We, we effortlessly look at art and the world around us. We look at pictures and it, it conveys so much information and we receive it and process it so effortlessly. But when you really start to look at it, it's a really kind of complex uh, modality and a complex process of extracting that information. Back in 2012, uh, as the legend goes, AlexNet really blew the lid off the deep learning field and ushered in this current phase of what we now call AI. Do you think it's significant that it was a computer vision problem that did this? Vision is um, a really good test bed for these sorts of machine learning techniques because it's a really complex, highly abstracted signal that we get when we look at an image. You know, an image is a billion dimensional representation of uh, really concrete concepts and the process of going from that billion dimensional representation that is a large set of pixels to recognizing that there's a cat or a person is a really challenging task and I think the significance of, of it being kind of that first problem that really brought everyone's attention to deep learning and, and machine learning generally it's just that it was such a challenging problem and it made a really natural test bed for machine learning techniques. So many breakthroughs come from asking the right questions, but when a new field like this emerges, we're often thwarted by what we don't know. Uh, do you think that this is just a matter of time, letting the machine reveal itself to us, or do we already need to be asking different questions? I think this is where kind of the creativity of the field comes in and the creativity of individual researchers, which to me is really exciting. I think we're, we're getting to the point now where, um, you know, we used to be driven by questions where we would say, look, I can look at this image or I can hear this sound or I can, you know, reason about this environment and come up with answers and can I, can I do that with an algorithm or, or a program or something like that. And now we're getting to the point where the answer to that question is generally yes most of the time. And so uh, I think one of the things that is great is that we get to be creative going forward and say, well, what else can we do? What are the things that maybe people can't do or people think we can't do, but maybe we really can? What new formulations in computer vision do you think we need to tackle to go beyond what we're doing now? I think as a field, one of the great things we've seen in terms of progress over the last 10 or 15 years is this move towards a more rigorous standard of what progress means. And so right now, progress is measured by, you know, how often you get things right. And, you know, that, that's, that's a very natural metric. You know, one of the things that our algorithms are generally fairly bad at right now is understanding when they don't know something. And I think that is going to require a bit of a redefinition and a rethink of, of how we collect our data sets, how we measure success on our data sets, because I think having the ability for a system to reliably say yes or no or I have no idea and maybe this needs some other sort of more conservative action at this point is something really important and we're not at this juncture really setting up our measures and our data sets to, to assess this performance. One of the more striking things about this conversation is a theme that keeps coming up, and that is questioning what we think we know. Uh, and you've made some really interesting statements about classifying an image as what we consider to be an image. Why is that a related problem, and what's the benefit of considering something as an image rather than a new modality of data? I think that it goes back a bit to, for me, what computer vision is and, and what we're doing, which is really looking at this really complicated signal and trying to extract information out from it. And I think a lot of the techniques that have been developed over the years in computer vision have actually very little embedded in them in terms of assumptions of the, the thing that you're observing or, or working with really being an image. And in this sense, I mean, you know, we typically think of images as a measurement of photons interacting with the environment at a specific range of wavelengths, right? That's, that's the really kind of classical technical definition of an image. And if you kind of just step back and understand that, look, images are just these kind of high dimensional, spatially organized measurements of some signal of the world around us, we actually get a whole bunch of other problems. And most of the algorithms and techniques that we've developed in computer vision are really applicable to those things. And so we can do things like try to measure black holes from radio telescopes. And we can do things like try to estimate the structure of proteins and viruses and other biological molecules from electron microscopy images. And, the, and these are all things that are not really images in the traditional sense, but 
Computer vision techniques work very, very well for them. Uh, and, and I think it's a really interesting way to think about the field to, to kind of broaden out the set of things that we think of as computer vision problems, but also as a way to better understand the, the limitations and, and characteristics of the methods that we've developed in the last 50 years as a field in computer vision. Your work has a certain flavor to it, which is building a lot of prior knowledge and known structure into the model so you can solve very hard problems uh, where other techniques at the moment can't solve. Now, this is the opposite of what a lot of other mainstream AI researchers are doing, which is trying to build as little prior knowledge as possible into the model. This is contrary to where a lot of people's philosophy currently lies. Why do you happen to take this particular approach? And what's your research philosophy? I don't really view it as being contrary to what people are doing. I actually think it's kind of complementary. It's, it's kind of the, the other side of the, the same coin. At the end of the day, all we're really doing is we're trying to take as much information as we can about the world and encode it into an algorithm or a method or a technique or whatever you want to call it to get some sort of intelligent behavior. And currently the field, you know, over the last couple of years, definitely been focused more on data-driven approaches where the information that you're putting into your model is just large amounts of data. But there's lots of other sources of information out there. There's domain-specific knowledge about um, you know, the type of problem that you're working with. And these are things that we're already encoding into the models that people are using with large amounts of data. So things like using um, convolutional layers and in, in, in deep learning. And so that's, that's, a, that's prior knowledge about the problem that's being incorporated in there. And so I don't really view the way that I work and the stuff that I've done as really being that much a field from what other people are doing. But that said, you know, it's, it's definitely true that my work has a different flavor to it. And um, part of it's because it's, those are the kinds of questions that interest me, is, is what can we really learn about these sorts of problems that we can then incorporate into models. And I think this is going to become an increasingly important question to ask going forward as we start looking at how do we solve problems with less data? How do we get better generalization out of the, the systems that we build? And, and one of the ways to do that is by encoding more knowledge and more information into the models that we build and the way that we train them. And, and so it's not to say that we should not use data, but just that we end up using data smarter and we end up using data uh, more efficiently. What's the last holy shit moment you had during your research? The last holy shit moment I had during my research? I'd have to say probably, I mean, actually I, I still have them every day whenever I work on, on actually cryo-EM data. Um, you know, this, this data is just terrible. It looks horrible. It just looks like noise. Um, and we're able to get really beautiful structures out of it. We're able to see carbon atoms and water molecules in incredible detail and be able to study these really fundamental processes at a cellular level. And then when you go back and you look at the data that we have and you look at the results that we get, it's just incredible and, and I still routinely say holy shit when I look at the, look at the stuff. Thank you so much for spending time with me. Well, thank you, my pleasure.